I'm Pat Tully of the Ketchikan Public Library, and this is Reading Aloud. This evening I'm going to read a poem and then a lecture by Walt Whitman. I'm not much of a poetry buff, but I am very fond of Walt Whitman. Whitman loved America with an all-encompassing passion. He loved not only our ideals, what we aspire to be, but who we are, how we live, and leaving nothing out. Whitman lived through the Civil War and its aftermath and wrote several touching tributes to Abraham Lincoln after his assassination in 1865. This evening I'm going to read one of those poems written just after the assassination and then a lecture he gave 15 years after. So let's get started. O oh, Captain, my Captain, for the death of Lincoln. O oh, Captain, my Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But, O oh, heart, 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 leave you not the little spot where on the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. O oh, captain, my captain, Rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung, for you the bugle trills. For you bouquets and ribboned wreaths, for you the shores a crowding. For you they call, the swaying mass, their eager faces churning. O oh, Captain, dear father, the, this arm I pushed beneath you. It is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer, his lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm, he has no pulse nor will. But the ship, the ship is anchored safe, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip the victor ship comes in with object one. Exult, O shores, and ring, O bells, but I with silent tread. Walk the spot my captain lies fallen, cold, and dead. The end. And now the lecture, Death of Abraham Lincoln Lecture, delivered in New York, April 14th, 1879. How often since that dark and dripping Saturday, that chilly April day, now 15 years bygone, my heart has entertained the dream, the wish to give of Abraham Lincoln's death, its own special thought and memorial. Yet now the sought-for opportunity offers. I find my notes incompetent. Why, for truly profound themes, is statements so idle? Why does the right phrase never offer? And the fit tribute I dreamed of waits unprepared as ever. My talk here, indeed, is less because of itself or anything in it, and nearly altogether because I feel a desire, apart from any talk, to specify the day, the martyrdom. It is for this, my friends, that I have called you together. Oft as the rolling years bring back this hour, let it again, however briefly, be dwelt upon. For my own part, I hope and desire, till my own dying day, whenever the 14th or 15th of April comes, to annually gather a few friends and hold its tragic reminiscence. No narrow or sectional reminiscence. It belongs to these states in their entirety, not the North only, but the South. Perhaps belongs most tenderly and devoutly to the South, of all. For there, really, this man's birthstock. There and thence his antecedent stamp. Why should I not say that thence his manliest traits, his universality, his canny, easy ways and words upon the surface, his inflexible determination and courage at heart. Have you never realized it, my friends, that Lincoln, though grafted on the West, is essentially in personnel and character a Southern contribution? And though by no means proposing to resume the secession war tonight, I would briefly remind you of the public conditions preceding that contest. For 20 years, and especially during the four or five before the war actually began, 
the aspect of affairs in the United States, though without the flash of military excitement, presents more than a survey of a battle, or any extended campaign, or series even, of nature's convulsions. The hot passions of the South, the strange mixture at the North of inertia, incredulity, and conscious power, and the incendiarism of the abolitionists, the rascality and grip of the politicians unparalleled in any land, any age. To these I must not omit adding the honesty of the essential bulk of the people everywhere. Yet with all this seething fury and contradiction of their natures, more aroused than the Atlantic's waves in wildest equinox. In politics, what can be more ominous, though generally unappreciated then? What more significant than the presidentiads of Fillmore and Buchanan? proving conclusively that the weakness and wickedness of elected rulers are just as likely to afflict us here as in the countries of the old world, under their monarchies, emperors, and aristocracies. In that old world were everywhere heard underground rumblings that died out only to again surely return. While in America the volcano, though civic yet, continued to grow more and more convulsive, more and more stormy and threatening. In the height of all this excitement and chaos, hovering on the edge at first, and then merged in its very midst, and destined to play a leading part, appears a strange and awkward figure. I shall not easily forget the first time I saw Abraham Lincoln. It must have been about the 18th or 19th of February, 1861. It was rather a pleasant afternoon in New York City as he arrived there from the West, to remain a few hours and then pass on to Washington to prepare for his inauguration. I saw him in Broadway, near the site of the present post office. He came down, I think, from Canal Street to stop at the Astor House. The broad spaces, sidewalks, and street in the neighborhood, and for some distance, were crowded with solid masses of people, many thousands, the omnibuses and other vehicles had all been turned off, leaving an unusual hush in that busy part of the city. Presently, two or three shabby black barouches made their way with some difficulty through the crowd and drew up at the Astor House entrance. A tall figure stepped out of the center of these barouches, paused leisurely on the sidewalk, looked up at the granite walls and looming architecture of the grand old hotel, then, after a relieving stretch of arms and legs, turned round for over a minute to slowly and good-humouredly scan the appearance of the vast and silent crowds. There were no speeches, no compliments, no welcome. As far as I could hear, not a word said. Still much anxiety was concealed in that quiet. Cautious persons had feared some marked insult or indignity to the president-elect, for he possessed no personal popularity at all in New York City, and very little political. But it was evidently tacitly agreed that a few, the few political supporters of Mr. Lincoln present would entirely abstain from any demonstration on their side. The immense majority, who were anything but supporters, would abstain on their side also. The result was a sulky, unbroken silence such as certainly never before characterized so great a New York crowd. Almost in the same neighborhood, I distinctly remembered seeing Lafayette on his visit to America in 1825. I had also personally seen and heard, various years afterwards, how Andrew Jackson, Clay, Webster, Hungarian Kossuth, Filibuster Walker, the Prince of Wales on his visit, and other celebrities, native and foreign, had been welcomed there. All that indescribable human roar and magnetism, unlike any other sound in the universe. The glad, exulting thunder shouts of countless union, unloosed throats of men. But on this occasion, not a voice, not a sound. From the top of an omnibus, driven up one side close by and blocked by the curbstone and the crowds, I had, I say, a capital view of it all and especially of Mr. Lincoln, his look and gait, his perfect composure and coolness, his unusual and uncouth height, his dress of complete black, stovepipe hat pushed 
back on the head. Dark brown complexion, seamed and wrinkled yet canny looking face. Black bushy head of hair, disproportionately long neck, and his hands held behind as he stood observing the people. He looked with curiosity upon that immense sea of faces, and the sea of faces returned the look with similar curiosity. In both there was a dash of comedy, almost farce, such as Shakespeare puts in his blackest tragedies. The crowd that hemmed around consisted, I should think, of thirty to forty thousand men, not a single one his personal friend. While I have no doubt, so frenzied were the ferments of the time, many an assassin's knife and pistol lurked in hip or breast pocket there, ready soon as break and riot came. But no break or riot came. The tall figure gave another relieving stretch of, or two of arms and legs. Then with moderate pace and accompanied by a few unknown looking persons, ascended the portico steps of the Astor House, disappeared through its broad entrance, and the dumb show ended. I saw Abraham Lincoln often the four years following that date. He changed rapidly and much during his presidency, but this scene and him in it are indelibly stamped upon my recollection. As I sat on the top of my omnibus and had a good view of him, the thought, dim and inchoate then, has since come out clear enough that four sorts of genius, four mighty and primal hands, will be needed to the complete limbing of this man's future portrait. The eyes and brains and finger touch of Plutarch and Aeschylus and Michelangelo assisted by Rabelais. And now Mr. Lincoln passing on from this scene to Washington, where he was inaugurated amid armed cavalry and sharpshooters at every point, the first instance of the kind in our history, and I hope it will be the last. Now the rapid succession of well-known events, too well-known, I believe these days, we almost hate to hear of them mentioned. The national flag fired on at Sumter, the uprising of the North, and paroxysms and astonishment and rage, the chaos of divided councils, the call for troops, the first bull run, the stunning cast down, shock and dismay of the North, and so in full flood the succession war. Four years of lurid, bleeding, murky, murderous war. Who paints those years with all their scenes, the hard-fought engagements, the defeats, plans, failures, the gloomy hours, days when our nationality seemed hung in pall of doubt, perhaps death, the Mephistophelian sneers of foreign lands and attaches, the dreaded Scylla of European interference, and the Charybdis of the tremendously dangerous latent strata of succession sympathizers throughout the free states, far more numerous than is, is supposed. The long marches in summer, the hot sweat and many a sunstroke as on the rush to Gettysburg in 63, the night battles in the woods, as under Hooker at Chancellorsville, the camps in winter, the military prisons, the hospitals, alas, alas, the hospitals. The succession war? Nay, let me call it the Union War. Though whatever called, it is even yet too near us, too vast and too closely overshadowing, its branches uniformed yet, but certain, shooting too far into the future and the most indicative and mightiest of them yet ungrown. A great literature will yet arise out of the era of those four years, those scenes, era encompassing centuries of native passion, first-class pictures, tempests of life and death, an inexhaustible mind for the histories, drama, romance, and even philosophy of peoples to come. Indeed, the vertebrae of poetry and art of personal character too, for all future America, far more grand in my opinion to the hands capable of it than Homer's Siege of Troy or the French Wars to Shakespeare. But I must leave these speculations and come to the theme I have assigned and limited myself to, of the actual murder of President Lincoln. Though so much has been written, probably the facts are yet very indefinite in most persons' minds. 
I read from my memoranda written at the time and revised frequently and finally since. The day, April 14th, 1865, seems to have been a pleasant one throughout the whole land. The moral atmosphere pleasant too. The long storm, so dark, so fratricidal, full of blood and doubt and gloom, over and ended at last by the sunrise of such an absolute national victory and the utter breakdown of secessionism. We almost doubted our own senses. Lee had capitulated beneath the apple tree at Appomattox. The other armies, the flanges of the revolt, swiftly followed. And could it really be, then? Out of all the affairs of this world of woe and failure and disorder, was there really come the confirmed, unerring sign of a plan, like a shaft of pure light, of rightful rule, of God? So the day, as I say, was propitious. Early herbage, early flowers were out. I remember where I was stopping at the time, the season being advanced. There were many lilacs in full bloom. By one of those caprices that enter and give tinge to events without being at all a part of them, I find myself always reminded of the great tragedy of that day by the sight and odor of those blossoms. It never fails. But I must not dwell on accessories. The deed hastens. The popular afternoon paper of Washington, the little evening star, had spattered all over its third page, divided among the advertisements in a sensational manner, in a hundred different places. The president and his lady will be at the theater this evening. Lincoln was fond of the theater. I have myself seen him there several times. I remember thinking how funny it was that he, in some respects, the leading actor in the stormiest drama known to real history staged through centuries, should sit there and be so completely interested and absorbed in those human jackstraws, moving about with their silly little gestures, foreign spirit, and flatulent text. On this occasion, the theater was crowded. Many ladies in rich and gay costumes, officers in their uniforms, many well-known citizens, young folks, the usual cluster of gaslights, the usual magnetism of so many people, cheerful with perfumes, music of violins and flutes, and overall, and saturating all, that vast, vague wonder, victory, the nation's victory, the triumph of the Union, filling the air, the thought, the sense, with exhilaration more than all music and perfumes. The president came betimes, and with his wife, witnessed the play from the large stage boxes on the second tier, two thrown into one, and profusely draped with the national flag. The acts and scenes of the piece, one of those singularly written compositions which have at least the merit of giving entire relief to an audience engaged in mental action or business excitements and cares during the day, as it makes not the slightest call on either the moral, emotional, aesthetic, or spiritual nature, a piece, Our American Cousin, in which, among other characters, so-called, a Yankee, Certainly such a one as was never seen, or the, at least the like of it ever seen in North America, is introduced in England, with a varied folderol of top, plot, scenery, and such phantasmagoria as goes to make up a modern popular drama, had progressed through perhaps a couple of its acts, when in the midst of this comedy, or none such, or whatever it is to be called, and to offset it, or finish it out, as if in nature's and the great muse's mockery of those poor memes, came interpolated that scene, not really or exactly to be described at all, for on the many hundreds who were there, it seems to this hour to have left a passing blur, a dream, a blotch, and yet partially to be describing as I now proceed to give it. There's a scene in the play representing a modern parlor in which two unprecedented English ladies are informed by the impossible Yankee that he is not a man of fortune, and therefore undesirable for marriage-catching purposes. After which, the comments being finished, the dramatic trio make exit, leaving the stage clear for a moment. At this period came the murder of Abraham Lincoln. Great is all its manifold train, encircling round it, 
and stretching into the future for many a century in the politics, history, art, etc. of the New World. In point of fact, the main thing, the actual murder, transpired with the quiet and simplicity of any commonest occurrence. The bursting of a bud or pod in the growth of vegetation, for instance. Through the general hum following the stage pause, with the change of positions, came the muffled sound of a pistol shot, which not one one-hundredth of a part of the audience heard the time, and yet a moment's hush. Somehow, surely, a vague startled thrill, and then, through the ornamented, draperied, starred, and striped spaceway of the president's box, a sudden figure, a man, raises himself with hands and feet, stands a moment on the railing, leaps below to the stage, a distance of perhaps 14 or 15 feet, falls out of position, catching his boot heel in the copious drapery, the American flag, falls on one knee, quickly recovers himself, rises as if nothing had happened. He really sprains his ankle, but unfelt then. And so the figure, Booth, the murderer, dressed in plain black broadcloth, bareheaded, with full glossy raven hair, and his eyes like some mad animals flashing with light and rev resolution, yet with a certain strange calmness, holds aloft in one hand a large knife, walks along not much back from the footlights, turns fully toward the audience his face of statuesque beauty, lit by those basilisk eyes, flashing with desperation, perhaps insanity, launches out in a firm and steady voice the words, Sic Semper Tyrannus, and then walks back with neither slow nor very rapid pace diagonally across to the back of the stage and disappears. Had not all this terrible scene making the mimic ones preposterous, had it not all been rehearsed in blank by Booth beforehand? A moment's hush, a scream, a cry of murder, Mrs. Lincoln leaning out of the box with ashy cheeks and lips, with involuntary cry, pointing to the retreating figure, he has killed the president. And still a moment's strange, incredulous suspense, and then the deluge, then that mixture of horror, noises, uncertainty, the sound somewhere back of a horse's hooves clattering with speed. The people burst through chairs and railings and break them up. There is an inextricable confusion and terror. Women faint, quite feeble persons fall and are trampled on. Many cries of agony are heard. The broad stage suddenly fills to suffocation with a dense and motley crowd like some horrible carnival. The audience rush generally upon it, at least the strong men do. The actors and actresses are all there in their play costumes and painted faces, with mortal fright showing through the rouge. The screams and calls, confused talk, redoubled, trebled. Two or three manage to pass up water from the stage to the president's box. Others try to clamor up, etc., etc. In the midst of all this, the soldiers of the president's guard, with others suddenly drawn to the scene, burst in, some 200 altogether. They storm the house through all the tiers, especially the upper ones, inflamed with fury, literally charging the audience with fixed bayonets, muskets, and pistols, shouting, clear out, clear out, you sons of... Such the wild scene, or a suggestion of it, rather, inside the playhouse that night. Outside, too, in the atmosphere of shock and craze, crowds of people, filled with frenzy, ready to seize any outlet for it, come near committing murder several times on innocent individuals. One such case was especially exciting. The infuriated crowd, through some chance, got started against one man for words he uttered, or perhaps without any cause at all, and were proceeding at once to actually hang him on a neighboring lamppost when he was rescued by a few heroic policemen who placed him in their midst and fought their way slowly and amid great peril toward the station house. It was a fitting episode of the whole affair. The crowd rushing and eddying to and fro, the night, the yells, the pale faces, 
many frightened people trying in vain to extricate themselves. The attacked man, not yet freed from the jaws of death, looking like a corpse. The silent, resolute, half-dozen policemen, with no weapons but their little clubs, yet stern and steady through all those eddying swarms, made a fitting side scene to the grand tragedy of murder. They gained the station house with the protected man, whom they placed in security for the night and discharged him in the morning. And in the midst of that pandemonium, infuriated soldiers, the audience and the crowd, the stage and all its actors and actresses, its paint pots, spangles, and gaslights, the lifeblood from those veins, the best and the sweetest of the land, slowly drips down, and death's ooze already begins its little bubbles on the lips. Thus the visible incidents and surrounding of Abraham Lincoln's murder as they really occurred. Thus ended the attempted secession of these states. Thus the four years war. But the main things come subtly and invisibly afterward, perhaps long afterwards. Neither military, political, nor, great as those were, historical. I say certain secondary and indirect results out of the tragedy of this death are, in my opinion, greatest. Not the event of the murder itself. Not that Mr. Lincoln strings the principal points and personages of the period, like beads, upon the single string of his career. Not that his idiosyncrasy, in its sudden appearance and disappearance, stamps this republic with a stamp more marked and enduring than any yet given by any one man, more even than Washington's. But, joined with these, the immeasurable value and meaning of that whole tragedy lies, to me, in senses finally dearest to a nation, and here all our own, the imaginative and artistic senses, the literary and dramatic ones. Not in any common or low meaning of those terms, but a meaning precious to the race and to every age. A long and varied series of contradictory events arrives at last at its highest poetic single, central, pictorial denouement. The whole involved, baffling, multiform whirl of the secession period comes to a head and is gathered in one brief flash of lightning illumination, one simple, fierce deed. Its sharp culmination, and as it were solution, of so many bloody and angry problems, illustrates those climax moments on the stage of universal time, where the historic muse at one entrance and the tragic muse at the other, suddenly ringing down the curtain, close an immense act in the long drama of creative thought and give it radiation, tableau, stranger than fiction. Fit radiation, fit close. How the imagination, how the students love these things. America too is to have them. For not in all great deaths, not far nor near, not Caesar in the Roman Senate House, or Napoleon passing away in the wild night storm at St. Helena, not Pale Paleologus falling, desperately fighting, piled over dozens deep with Grecian corpses, not calm old Socrates drinking the hemlock, outvies that terminus of the secession of war in one man's life, here in our midst, in our own time, that seal of the emancipation of three million slaves, that parturition and delivery of our last really free republic, born again, henceforth to commence its career of genuine homogeneous union, compact, consistent with itself. Nor will ever future American patriots and unionists, indifferently over the whole land, or north or south, find a better moral to their lesson. The final use of the greatest men of a nation is, after all, not with reference to their deeds in themselves or their direct bearing on their times or lands. The final use of a heroic, eminent life, especially of a heroic, eminent death, is its indirect filtering into the nation and the race, and to give, often at many removes, but unerringly, age after age, color and fiber to the personalism of youth and the maturity of that age and of mankind. Then there is a cement to the whole people, subtler, more underlying than anything in written constitution 
or courts or armies, namely the cement of a death identified thoroughly with that people at its head and for its sake. Strange, is it not, that battles, martyrs, agonies, blood, even assassination, should so condense, perhaps only really lastingly condense, a nationality. I repeat it, the grand deaths of the race, the dramatic deaths of every nationality, are its most important inheritance value, in some respects beyond its literature and art. As the hero is beyond his finest portrait, and the battle itself beyond its choicest song or epic. Is not here indeed the point underlying all tragedy? The famous pieces of the Grecian masters and all masters? Why, if the old Greeks had had this man, what trilogies of plays, what epics would have been made out of him? How the rhapsodies would have recited him? How quickly that quaint tall form would have entered into the region where men vitalize gods and gods divinify man. But Lincoln, his times, his death, great as any, any age, belong altogether to our own and our autoclontic. Sometimes indeed I think our American days, our own stage, the actors we know and have shaken hands or talked with, more fateful than anything in Aeschylus, more heroic than the fighters around Troy, afford kings of men for our democracy prouder than Agamemnon, models of character cute and hardy as the Ulysses, deaths more pitiful than Priam's. When, centuries hence, as it must, in my opinion, be centuries hence, before the life of these states or of democracy can be really written and illustrated, the leading historians and dramatists seek for some personage, some special event, incisive enough to mark with deepest cut and memnonize this turbulent 19th century of ours, not only these states, but all over the political and social world. Something perhaps to close that gorgeous procession of European feudalism with all its pomp and caste prejudices, of whose long train we in America are yet so inextricably the heirs. Something to identify with terrible identification by far the greatest revolutionary step in the history of the United States, perhaps the greatest in the world, our century, the absolute extirpation and erasure of slavery from the states. Those historians will seek in vain for any point to serve more thoroughly their purpose than Abraham Lincoln's death. Dear to the muse, thrice dear to nationality, to the whole human race, precious to this union, precious to democracy, unspeakably and forever precious, their first great martyr chief. The end. Thank you so much for joining me and have a good week.